welcome back to Get a Heck Yes with me, your host, Carissa Wu. I have a very, 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 very special guest today. <laughs> um, her name is Cassidy Lynn, and I was on her podcast about like a month ago talking about mastering the sales call, but Cassidy is super crazy Insta-famous, and she is <laughs> matcha-obsessed Michigan wedding photographer and photography educator focused on helping you grow as a photographer. Welcome, Cassidy. Thank you for having me. That I didn't realize that like that intro that I sent you was going to be like the intro that you used, you know? <laughs> it's okay. I do like a separate intro too, just talking about like we what we talked about. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm honored to be on an episode. Yeah. So I have to admit, like when I was on your show a month ago, um, I actually didn't know how famous you were. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. It's not like, I don't really feel like I'm famous. I would say I probably am just like a micro influencer, um, but like barely. I feel like I don't really do the influencing. I just, you know, post normal stuff and then people follow me. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's interesting because like no one ever gives me compliments about my podcast or like DMs me or anything. And then when I was on your show, I literally got like six DMs saying they loved the episode. Oh, cool. And, and like everyone that I talked to, like my interns and my photographer friends, I'll ask them like, who do they follow? And they're like, oh, Cassidy from Oh Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's been crazy. My podcast has um, blown up in ways that I haven't expected it to. Really? Um, so... Yeah, with my Instagram, I feel like I also equally get a lot of people who find me through my podcast now, which is crazy because I only started it, you know, like a year ago. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's crazy how just you can use different platforms to make different impacts, you know? Yeah, you're super fun to follow on Instagram and TikTok, and I love your podcast. <laughs> um, even you putting like teaching me how to do my makeup, like the clean girl style. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like I got a lot of tips from you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And little little sprinkles here and there. I try to do just like little fun things of fashion or makeup just to kind of, I don't know. If there are people who aren't photographers who are following me, just keep it interesting. But also, you know, that that's a big part of building a brand is just like being yourself. And those are things I'm really passionate about. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to post about them. Yes. Passionate about being yourself. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So how long have you been in wedding photography? Um, so I think my first wedding was in 2017, at the end of 2017. Um, so it's been five, I would say like four and a half, almost five years. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where, where wow. it all started was four and a half years ago, my first wedding ever. Wow. So how, like, take me back to like your younger years, um, you grew up in Michigan and how you like kind of fell in love with wedding photography. Yeah. So I, um, I started photography. Like the first time I ever picked up a camera was actually my first year in college. Um, I, they had, they had like a few different like creative teams that you could join. And I was like, Oh, photography kind of sounds fun. And so I really just kind of faked it and had some random photos on my camera roll that I thought were good. And I did have a photographer friend and I used his camera and took some photos and submitted them and I made the photography team. So that first year and me doing college, I was on the photography team doing um, events and candids and headshots and like just all the things that a college would need for content. Right. Um, and as I was doing that, I started to get better. It definitely took me at least like six months to even understand what ISO meant. But once <laughs> I started like understanding it and getting better, um, I actually got hired on for another year, but then on staff with them for their on staff photographer. And during that time, I had access to a lot of really great gear. So like um, at the time, like the Canon 5D Mark three, Mark four, um, you know, like the 70 to 200s and the 35 millimeter, like all the things that someone who's just starting out in photography wouldn't have access to. Like, that's what I had access to right when I started. So I definitely had like a jump start in that way. Um, and 
as I was, you know, doing photos for the college, I basically started doing photos of my friends and my sisters, you know how it goes, like just doing portraits whenever you can. Um, so did that and then got my first wedding booking. It was just like one of my friends had a friend that was getting married and she recommended me. I booked that. The wedding was not phenomenal. Like I did not do a good job. Um, you know, I, but I got my first wedding and that's what mattered to me. And then from there, because I started posting, um, that work that I have from that one wedding, um, I got another wedding. And then because of that, I got another wedding. Um, and slowly I figured out that my love for events and candids, which, you know, was how my photography started. And then also my love for doing portraits of like my sisters and stuff like that kind of weddings are the perfect mix of that. So Mm. perfect mix of candids, but also pose stuff and stuff where I have a little bit more control. So I really liked that part of wedding photography. So that just kind of stuck with me. And that's kind of how it grew was just through me getting more experience, realizing that that's what I loved. And then I niched down was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And then here we are. Wow. What a a journey and what a fast journey. You you built your business so fast. I was going to say like, um, I just feel like you, when you explain things and you educate people on TikTok and Instagram and your um, podcast, you have mm-hmm. a very interesting way of explaining things where it makes it very simple and easy. Um, how oh. did you have any like teaching background or how, where did that, where does this come from? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so actually, as I was working for that college, I mentioned I got hired on as staff and um, when I got hired on in that position, I then was in charge of teaching the student team how to do photography. So when I first started the, yeah, the person that taught me how to do it, I was in the position of teaching those photographers how to do it. So I had three years, I did that for three years and I had three teams of four students. So I taught 12 people how to do photography. Um, and actually while I was doing that in my last year, I also transitioned to being um, part-time like social media coordinator for them. So I also was getting social media experience and um, experimenting on social media accounts that weren't mine, but I grew those accounts quite a bit. So I was getting experience in that way as well. Um, wow, but I think like, like this has me. Let's give a shout out to your college. What college did you go to? <laughs> um, I actually went to just a one year Bible college. It's called Word of Life. It's very small in upstate New York, but it definitely did help me a ton with just learning, learning the ropes and learning photography. Ah, oh, that's amazing. So when did you start your education programs and becoming like kind of like a mentor, coach, educator? Yeah. Um, so kind of like, I would say the beginning of COVID or like, not like the beginning of COVID. I think it was like before COVID, maybe, maybe like September. Well, a dates are so hard for me. I'm just going to say like, it was, so I mentioned I was working part-time at this college and at the same time I was doing wedding photography. So when I decided that I wanted to go full-time in wedding photography, Um, that was when I kind of realized that I was going to have a lot more free time than I had before. Um, so that was when I started creating content for photographers. Um, really it was super simple. I just started by posting TikToks, um, targeted towards photographers. And then after doing that for maybe a month or so, I was like, you know what, if I'm going to be creating content, I was posting every single day. And I was like, if I'm going to be creating content for photographers, I want to have something that they can buy from me or something that they can learn more from me without just, just being TikTok. Like I want something more because I've, I've followed creators before where I love the education that they give, but I'm like, okay, you don't have anything else. Like I have no other way of diving wow. into your, your content. So I created, um, three very simple, um, just like video guides. And then I did, um, one free guide, which then I've released more since then. But those are kind of my things where I was like, I'm just gonna have a little tiny shop in case anyone wants to learn from me from my TikTok videos. And then from there transitioned over to Instagram. And then, you know, the rest is basically history. Cause once it starts, it's really hard to stop. (laughs) Wow. That's so interesting. So do you, uh, I know you have the shop, which I I've been on it and it looks so amazing. So do you, you coach too? Yeah. So I don't do like, um, recurring coaching right now. Uh Um, so like if you, if you were like a photography student, I wouldn't like meet with you every single like two weeks or something, but I do like individual kind of like a la carte 
mentor calls. So I do Q&A calls, editing calls, and then um, social media marketing calls. Um, And for me right now, that fits better with my schedule because I am still doing a lot of weddings full time. Uh Um, Yeah. So I, I found that kind of like having a course, like a few courses available, and then just like the individual calls works best because coaching is a very big time commitment. I feel like if I wanted to do that, it probably would be my whole job at that point. And yeah, I'm not yeah. quite ready for that to happen yet. You know? Yeah, you're still, you're still a baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am a little bit. <laughs> okay, so I want to, let's see, dive a little bit deeper into like your younger years. Like I know you're just so ambitious and so intelligent. Like where does this all come from? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I think – Growing up, I was always very creative. Um, I loved art class. I feel like every photographer loved art class, but um, <laughs> I I also um, started kind of. I always like had like some sort of little business going on in high school. Oh, so wow. you know, it even started in like elementary school. Like I would go and buy like with my mom, we'd buy like bulk candy, and then I would go and like sell it in my classes for like classroom dollars. And then I would use those classroom dollars to get something that I wanted, you know, like stuff like that. And then in in high school, I actually um, did hair and hairstyling and hair coloring and cutting. Uh Um, I was literally like 15 or 16. Um, So I did that for brides. Like I was booking weddings on the weekends and making money on the side through that. And I also like worked at um, a resale shop and I would buy expensive clothes for like cheap and I would resell them on eBay. So I was always doing something as far as the business side of it. And I think once I found photography, which is something that I really loved and then paired it with like my business entrepreneur, just like this thing that I've always had, that's when I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. Does that kind of make sense? Did your parents kind of encourage you to be like entrepreneurial as since elementary school or you just did it? I think so. I mean, my parents never, ever discouraged me to do anything. It was always like my my mom always says like Cassidy is like the artistic one. And it's like I, I feel like that's true. Like but also like any of my other sisters could be artistic. My parents would encourage it. My yeah. my parents were just awesome. Like they never told me you can't do this. If anything, like my first wedding that I booked was all the way in Pennsylvania, which was 12 hours from where I lived in Michigan. (laughs) My mom came with me and drove with me to my first wedding. So it's like, I feel like my parents definitely had like, like I had that helping hand, not in the sense that they like, they didn't like give me money or anything for it, but it was just like, I had their support. And I think sometimes um, when people are like in college and they're getting a degree in something, a lot of parents can put pressure on their children to, you know, go do this or go do this. Like you have to be a doctor, you have to be a nurse. And those, those people really struggle in photography because they feel like they're not, they're going against their parents' wishes. But I never had that. Like my parents always just wanted me to do whatever I wanted really. Um, so I definitely think that helped in the long run, just like yeah, for where I, I have- am now. That's amazing. I have this um, guy I'm teaching and he's like mid 20s and he's actually a lawyer and his true passion is wedding photography. But he just so scared to tell him and I was like, he wants to just quit the lawyer thing. And I just said, like, you have to tell him eventually. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's just keeping it a secret. Yeah. (laughs) It's hard. Like when you are, especially when, you know, when money gets involved with like, like, you know, law school, that is a huge expense. Like that is really hard because, you know, you go through all of that debt because it's like, oh, at the end of it, I'm going to be able to make up for it with the salary I'm going to have. Right. But then when you go and you switch it over, it's like, okay, that's, that's really tough. So I, I would have a really hard time in that situation as well. I feel like I would almost not be as creative or entrepreneurial if I was in that type of situation, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. My parents were the same way. Like they let me do whatever I wanted, but I was in the ad agency world and uh, it was a pretty good job for like Toyota was a client. And mm-hmm. when I told my parents that I was quitting, they were kind of freaking out, but they just let me kind of explore and figure out what I wanted to do. Yeah. So, and yeah, that, that's how I want to parent awesome. too. Yeah, cool. totally. yeah. I love it. Okay. So how would you describe your style? Oh, 
Um, I feel like my style changes every single month. Um, <laughs> well, I think, I don't think it actually changes, but I think I make minor tweaks enough to where I like always feel like my style is changing. Um, I definitely love, like I mentioned, I love candids. Um, uh -huh. so I definitely have a documentary type of photography, but at the same time, I love getting poses and getting like the shot, the classic shots that everyone wants. So I would definitely say I'm a mix of like, you know, candid, but also I do some posing as well. And I love warm tones. I am like a golden hour girl. I think everyone is. Um, but like, I, I just love shooting a golden hour and I don't know. I, I think my vibe is a little bit more on the vibrant and fun side as far uh -huh. as colors go. Mm -hmm. But, um, besides that, I really just try to capture my couples as they are, um, you know, and just they're fun and exciting and so excited to be engaged. You know, that's what I'm capturing. Or if it's like, oh, we're like feeling more of like the moody vibe. Like I capture that too. You know, like I love a little bit more of like a retro film vibe. So my style's all over the place. But I think the one thing that's important to me is just making sure that I love my photos. And if I love my photos, then I'm fulfilled. So I think that's, that's really Ooh. what I focus on when it comes to style. That's a really good mindset. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone is living under a rock... And doesn't know you like I was, um, <laughs> Cassidy out, um, and it's just breathtaking work. And the way you educate people and influence our community is pretty much like the best I ever seen. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm like Cassidy has like a lot of cool earrings. Like maybe I should get more piercings <laughs> on my ear. Like. <laughs> have a lot of piercings and it's it's funny that you noticed that because I'm like I feel like those types of things people don't care about but at the end of the day I, people really do care like and when you're in like in a position that I'm in it's easy to feel like why am I doing this like people don't care like people don't care about my dog people don't care about um you know like what I'm putting in my hair today like they just care about my photography and that's it but at the end of the day I think that my brand is the way that it is because of me and like the yeah. same for anyone listening your brand is like the people that are following you the people that are invested in your business are invested because of you it's not because of any other factor like yeah you probably have good photos too like okay i'll give you that but like the other things like it, it's also minuscule when it comes down to like branding like it's just you that matters yeah it's so interesting like when i was pregnant with my first kid i didn't tell anyone and i hid my bump till like eight months and i thought in my head that people weren't going to book me anymore because they're like, oh, we don't want like a new mom as a photographer. But mm -hmm. it actually like skyrocketed in my business when I became a mom and they just wanted to like see my kids and, you know, know what's going on in my life. So it was so weird. <laughs> right. Yeah, it is. It is weird. But that that's how it works like on social media. Like that is how that is the name of the game. Yes, it is. Personal brand. So tell us about your hot topic, why you chose it. And I kind of know what it's about. And tell us like a little bit about your Instagram following because it's freaking insane. Oh, thank you. So um, I, I wanted to talk about Instagram and TikTok um, because I just feel like I basically live on those apps. Um, I feel like I know them pretty well. I'm constantly posting stuff. Um, so yeah, I just feel like that if there's any topic that I want to talk about for like 45 minutes, it's probably going to be Instagram or TikTok. And, and, and any conversation I have like on a podcast, somehow I always bring it back to something that happened on Instagram or TikTok. So that's why I wanted to talk about that. Um, and you said my followers. Yeah. So you, your following is like insane. And this number guys is outrageous for our community, the photography community, but also like the, your engagement of followers. Like, I feel like all your followers are so engaged. And like I said, in the beginning, <laughs> like I meet photographers all the time. They come shoot with me and they're just like, I follow Cassidy from O shoot. And I'm like, <laughs> I was on her podcast and she's going to be on mine. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of tell us to get people super pumped. Yeah. So, um, on Instagram, um, I had to pull out my phone because I feel like the number is constantly changing. Um, I have 87.6 thousand followers. Okay. And then on TikTok, I have 130.8 thousand. Um, wow. and I think like the thing with followers is 
the reason I have followers, the reason I have a lot of followers is because the people that I'm targeting and the audience that I'm targeting is much wider than someone that's just targeting people getting married in Los Angeles, right? So Mm -hmm. like I'm targeting photographers. I'm targeting lots and lots of people. Photographers, that could be like a group of like like 40 million people could be interested in photography versus like potential clients is a a different number. So I do want to say like followers are great, but photographers don't always pay the bills unless what you are pushing and what your business is about is geared towards those followers. So if you are posting stuff and attracting photographers to your page, but you primarily get your income from weddings and sessions, then the people that follow you aren't going to be paying your bills. So that's something to keep in mind. Like following does not always equal income. Um, So that's why a lot of people say like followers don't matter. Um, I do think that in a sense, followers do give you credibility. I think followers open up more doors for opportunity. Mm -hmm. But I also think that followers don't pay the bills, like I just said. So like there's an equal balance between knowing, okay, this follower count is important. This follower count, not so important, you know? Yeah. I like how you explained that because I actually never thought of it like that. And it is interesting because I think I have a lot of followers, not that much, but, um, like I have a lot of followers because I started Instagram so early and I adopted a lot of followers like in the very beginning, but sometimes I'll post like a photo and I'll get like five likes and I'm like, what the heck? Like it's so (laughs) weird. Um, and yeah. I feel like my followers are maybe just super random and it's better to have followers that actually like really, really enjoy your content or like people like, like photographers, like they're, right. they're your like ride or dies and like they follow everything that you do. So it's, right. it's an interesting thing, but yeah, because I have like a good amount of followers, like it has opened up some doors for me. Right. Exactly. And I think too, like sometimes potential clients do look at that number and they they say like, okay, if 10,000 people are willing to follow this photographer, then they must be like worth talking to or like they must, you know, there, there must be something special here and maybe that will interest me in reaching out. Um, so I do think that impacts whether or not a client is interested, but at the same time, Um, I think if you can just create a personal connection with 20 followers, that's going to be way more impactful than uh, like you have 10,000 followers, but you only have a personal connection with five of them. You know, like the the 20 people that are invested in you, those people are going to go tell their friend and their cousin if if they need a photographer, like they're going to be like, Oh, I follow this photographer. Like this person, I'm so invested. You should book this person. You know, like that's what I do. Like if someone is looking for, I don't know, a photographer in a certain area, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I follow this person. I love their brand. You should work with them. And I think that's impactful. It's like creating a connection with whatever number you have, focus on the connection, focus on responding to DMS, responding to comments, um, responding to stories, interacting with their content, that's what you want to focus on. And then you might not grow in followers. You might grow in followers, but you're going to at least build your business in a way that's worthwhile and like long lasting. Yeah. Because we have to remember that, you know, if you're charging like 5k plus or even 4k, you only need like 25 weddings a year or for coaching. If you're a high ticket coach, you only need maybe like two clients, two, three clients a month. So it's like that mindset of just really being authentic. But is that what you would say like your tip number one would be is just to kind of like focus on like kind of finding your people and being authentic? Oh yeah, totally. I think if we're just breaking down Instagram and TikTok, the biggest thing you can do is be yourself. Um, There are so many accounts out there right now who are pushing a personal brand. And I'm telling, I'm telling people be a personal brand, but do it in a way that's different than everyone else is doing it. Um, so a lot of personal brands right now are, um, posting reels and they're lip syncing to certain audios and they're putting text over it. And you know, that's what a lot of people are doing right now. So I always challenge people on social media to find something that's lacking in your niche. Um, whether it's, um, reels or if it's like, um, 
I don't even know, like certain types of photos, like whatever is lacking and you feel inspired about, that's what you should be posting because like being unique is the biggest way to eliminate competition, right? Like competition goes away when there's no one else but you. And I think that's like a really important thing about social media. Um, If I go on to another tip, if we're just talking practical things right here for a sec, um, a big thing for Instagram and TikTok is hashtags. And I know photographers, I, I coach or not coach, but like do mentor sessions with photographers and we'll look over their Instagram. And one of the first things I notice is that they don't use any hashtags, like period, like no hashtags at all. And they're like, why is my account not growing? Or why am I not getting bookings from Instagram? And it's like, well, your content is not searchable. You're not telling the platform what your, what your content's about. Like, it's not just going to magically reach the right audience because a video and an image is not readable, right? So like Google can yeah. read words. It mm-hmm. can't read images and videos. So mm-hmm. you need to tell the platform, what what is this? And you're going to do that through hashtags primarily. So on every single reel you post, every single feed post, um, every single TikTok, you want to be using hashtags that are specific for the audience that you're targeting. So if you are a wedding photographer based in Dallas, Texas, you want to be doing hashtag Dallas wedding photographer, hashtag Dallas photographer, hashtag Dallas, hashtag da- Texas wedding photographer. Notice how those are all location specific hashtags because your ideal client and the people that are going to be paying your bills are the people in Dallas. Unless you are willing to travel, then you want to maybe try hashtagging a few of the locations you want to travel to, or you could do hashtag like destination wedding photographer or something like that. But for the most part, your hashtag should be for the people that your services are made for. Then on TikTok as well, you want to use a little bit more general hashtags on TikTok. Um, Usually I recommend um, if you're like a wedding photographer, let's say in Dallas, Um, I would recommend doing hashtags like hashtag Dallas, hashtag wedding, hashtag photographer, and then maybe like mix up a few of those combos. Because if you think about your potential client, which is people in Dallas looking for a wedding photographer, so all of those things, they probably have other wedding inspo on their TikTok page. So they've probably already liked and saved wedding videos, right? If they're even like close to getting engaged, that's always on your mind, right? So if you start posting things with hashtag wedding, hashtag wedding inspo, you're going to show up in front of the right people and then pair it with a Dallas or Texas hashtag. And you're getting in front of people who will have saved wedding videos who live in Dallas, right? Which is your ideal client. Like that's what you want. So I think hashtags are slept on and... I get a lot of bookings from hashtags. Like if people find me randomly, it'll be like, oh yeah, I found you through a hashtag. Or like I was looking under um, the hashtag of my wedding venue and you popped up and I booked you because of that, you know? So I think that's, that's a big thing with social media is using hashtags. So are you saying that when they save like, uh, random videos that are from like Dallas photographers and then you post hashtags about like Dallas wedding photographers, like does the algorithm like bump you up or to their feed? Is that correct? Um, it, it's not going to like instantly put you on the feed, but when, so just think of like how an algorithm works. Like if, if I am, um, the creator of TikTok and I'm like, I want to make everyone's feed personal to them. And I want to make it so that they're going to stay in the app longer, right? Because that's the goals. Stay in the app longer, be entertained for longer, use my app for longer. So like we're more popular, we get paid more, whatever. So when that's the goal, you are as the algorithm, as a TikTok algorithm, you are noticing what videos are being saved and what videos are being watched more times than once, like what videos you're liking, what videos you're sending to people. And then based on all that info that TikTok has on you, it's going to put videos on your feed that are most related to the content that you're interacting with because the content you interact with is the content that you like. Um, Uh So it's not guaranteed that you're going to pop up in front of Dallas, you know, people that are engaged in Dallas because if the content in your video isn't good, then your video is not going to go anywhere. 
Um, the thing with the algorithm is you can do all the right hashtags, but if the content isn't good, it's not like literally TikTok is not going to push your video out. So the way that the TikTok algorithm works and um, how like viral videos start is TikTok and Instagram shows your video to a small amount of people, right? So let's say it's a pool of 50 people that based on the interactions you get from there, it will then push it to, let's say 200 people based on those interactions, it pushes it to 3000 people. And then like, it'll determine whether or not your video goes viral based on your interactions and watch time and, um, Mm. shares and all of those things. So if the content in your video itself isn't good, like your video is not going to show up to the right people. Because I also think when you have generic hashtags, like Dallas and wedding, like those, there's going to be a lot of things under that hashtag. So in order to get in front of the right audience, you're probably going to need at least like 10,000 views or something in order for it to start getting in front of those mm-hmm. right people. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm, my mind is blown from hashtags, but I mean, I went to Hawaii with my family last November and I found the family photographer um, through a hashtag and I spent yeah. like over a thousand dollars on her. So um, yeah. And for my Absolutely. kids parties, like I just, I find people through hashtags for like, um, yeah. like the arts or like, you know, birthday cake and um, random stuff. So yeah, don't forget to use your hashtags guys, because I forget all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've done the same thing. I've, for our anniversary trip, um, we went to Palm Springs. I found the photography we use through a hashtag, you know, like the wedding photographer that I use for my wedding through a hashtag. Like it, it is like basically the thing that everyone does. If it's not that it's literally typing in the Instagram search bar, like looking up Dallas wedding photographer. That's another thing that people will do as well. Wow. Okay. This is so cool. Okay. So I'm going to recap real fast. Tip number one, be yourself. Tip number two, do things differently than other people. Everyone's doing the, you know, posting and reels, dancing. Maybe don't do that. (laughs) And number three, (laughs) um, you blew our mind with the hashtag. So take us away with tip number four. Ooh, okay. Well, I don't think some people are not going to be very happy hearing this, but, um, you need to be posting video content. Um, videos are, I am going to say that it's basically the only way that people are growing right now are through videos. Um, if people, people that are posting how they used to post on Instagram, like a year or two ago, it's not working anymore. So video content is the way to go. Um, showing your face is the way to go. Recording behind the scenes videos of yourself, um, is the best way to market yourself right now. If you are trying to grow on Instagram and you're not willing to post a video to reels, um, I have a feeling that you're going to not book as much as you could. Um, there's untapped potential in video content and I think it's only, going to go up from there. I don't think video content is going away. I think static content is going away. So Mm -hmm. single posts, like just graphics, like I think that type of stuff is not becoming a thing anymore. And it's, it's not like we have to overcomplicate it either by filming these super intricate storylines. Like I'm thinking of like, let's say an Instagram account takes these tweets and they screenshot them and they post it to their feed. And that's what they've been doing for years and years and years. And they get tons and tons of followers from that. But now Mm -hmm. video content's big. Okay. So how do you fix that? Well, you're going to take that same tweet that you've been screenshotting and posting for years and years. You're going to put it in a video. You're going to put like a moving background behind it, put a song to it that matches the vibe and you're going to post it and it's going to perform really well. And that's going to be your new strategy. Um, it doesn't have to be this overcomplicated thing where you all of a sudden have to be Charlie D'Amelio and dance in front of the camera. Like uh-huh. literally photographers can still post their photos. They just have to put it to a song. Like that's all. Yes. And you have to show multiple photos. That's the only change really. But I think the people that aren't even willing to do that are really going to struggle with the shift that is happening in social media right now. I mean, there's a reason that an app like TikTok blew up so quickly, so fast and like got so huge and it's only video content, right? There's nothing else on TikTok. So it's like, that is the future because this thing blew up and basically is almost at the same level as Instagram at this point. And it's just video. And Instagram feels that because they 
you know, got reels, right? Like that is a real thing. Like reels became a thing because TikTok was a thing. So the transition is happening. And I think the more adaptable your business is, the more willing you are to post videos and be adaptable in that sense, the more successful you're going to be marketing wise. Yeah. And I think your last um, post was really great advice how you said, oh, it's super busy right now, you know, wedding season, um, but your mindset about posting and you said you have a mindset of like batching. So yeah. you three reels and one post and mm-hmm. you plan that you say every three days or every week. Yeah. Every three days is usually what I try to do. Yeah. That was a very, really good tip. It kind of hit me because um, obviously you just explained like why you should do video, but when you think about Instagram and you feel overwhelmed or it's affecting your mental health, um, you really need to look at it as like a bird's eye view, um, even like a month out or a week out or three reels and a post out because it's going to help you so much. Because if you're thinking like daily what to post, it's just too much brain work. And I think that's what when it causes kind of like that um, kind of like anxiety or like overwhelm, but you have to think of right. it as batching. So I think that was such a, like it really hit. It's so interesting. Yeah. And the, the thing that's hard about batching, um, like you said, if you post every single day and like create your post once a day, that's very overwhelming, um, very stressful at the same time. If you schedule out your reels and you do 30 for a month, right? So you schedule out your posts, you do everything for a month that is almost just as harmful one because of the fact that you trying to create all of those ideas and all that content in one day absolutely sucks sucks Mm -hmm. just as much as posting every single day creating a new concept every day um also the way that trends work on instagram and tiktok they don't live for 30 days they live for three days that's Mm -hmm. why i do the three day Mm -hmm. thing because trends don't last longer than three days to seven days um, and I, and even with trends on TikTok and trends on Instagram, they live on TikTok for a week and it takes about a week for them to get over to Instagram. Then that's a trend on Instagram as well. So the reason I do the three day thing, because I used to do a week and then I, I was feeling like I would create these trending videos at the beginning of the week, end of the week, they're not trending anymore. So I basically am always an active user on any platform I use, TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever. N- notice what's doing well, you know, like what are the videos that entice me? What are the the sounds I notice? And then I save those. And then every three days I go back to my save videos and say, okay, this is an audio. Like this was something that I gave me an idea or like if I don't save a video, it's just like, I have an idea. I'm going to create an original audio. And then I do the three reels for three days. And then I do usually one post. Um, and I post a reel basically every single day. So that's why I do, you know, three reels, every three days. Cause it's like, I get one video a day. Um, and you know, it, it's all about trends. And, um, the only exception to that would be if you are wanting to create original audios, you can batch 30, 30 days in advance mm-hmm. because original audios are not trending. Mm-hmm. That's something that just like, you know, kind of just like, you know, you can post it whenever. So sometimes if I'm leaving on like a really long trip or something, I'll do, I'll batch a bunch of original audios and post them because it's like, okay, I don't want to rely on a trend. So I'm just going to use my original audio and it's probably going to perform how it always performs. It, it's probably not going to go viral, but at least I know how my original audios do versus like, if I post a trend that's late, it's probably just going to flop, you know? Yeah. 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 I really like your mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> and I really, I think a big takeaway from this conversation is that you know, you always could be changing with technology, but it doesn't have to be upsetting or hard. Like you said about the tweet, like the static image of the tweet on Instagram, but changing that into like a video with like a cool background, like people just are so scared to adopt to new things. And I think that could kind of make or break your business in this day and age where everything is moving so fast, but Mm -hmm. with the mindset also, like it doesn't have to be so scary. No. And the people that take social media too seriously are usually the people that don't succeed at it. Um, Social media and TikTok, Instagram, people just want to see something that's relatable, entertaining, um, usually fun. Um, If you are so 
business focused on your social media, that's boring. Like the, the idea of like being a business has been around for so long. Like how long have businesses been around? That's how long the idea of business has been around. So when you're, when you're just being a business, like that's boring, you know, like I always, always talk about, um, the, the TikToks, scrub daddy and Duolingo. Okay. Scrub daddy is a sponge, like literal, a literal sponge. And Duolingo is the app that you use to learn other languages, right? So these two accounts are not pushing their products. They are just being funny, good, just being a good presence on social media. And as a result, they're selling more because you're in the forefront of their mind. It doesn't matter how they're in the forefront of your mind. Literally Duolingo posts about how, I don't know, like Duolipa, like they, like it, their content uh-huh. is not necessarily like quality content, but it's just content that just sticks, you know? And I think that that's, what's important is like, you need to be adaptable and you need to do something that sticks. And from there, you'll understand it. And the more that you're just focusing on, I need to be a business. I need to be professional. That's, that's going to hurt you because it's like on social media, that's not what people want to see. Like, and that's not what I want to see. That's probably not what you want to see. It's not interesting. So let's kind of wipe that away and let's focus on being unique and creative with it. <laughs> you see my face? I'm like, I can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is such a good conversation. Okay. Uh, I guess that wraps it up with the tips, but some, mm-hmm. some more questions to end the uh, episode, but I have to ask what's your favorite heck yes sales technique. You pretty much kind of just said it, but in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's basically creating the connection before anyone even reaches out to you. So oh, I get people whoa. on social media that follow me for a year, two years and book me because they feel connected with me. It just was, wasn't the right time for them mm-hmm. to book me, right? You know, like someone that's in college, not engaged yet. Um, follow They follow me for a little bit. They feel so connected with me when they get engaged then they book me. And it's, it's never like, Oh, I'm on a sales call. And I really sold you on this. It's like, they were sold before they were even in my inbox because of the presence that's on social media and because of the connection that they feel to me. And I think that that's my biggest sales technique. Obviously it doesn't, it doesn't work for everyone. Um, but it works for me. So. Yeah. I really feel connected to you. (laughs) Thank you. I feel connected to you too, Carissa. Oh, thank you. Oh my God. I'm so happy. Okay. So let's see. What was your favorite moment on your road trip? Oh yes. Okay. Anyone that's listening that doesn't know, I went on like a month long road trip in March, um, throughout the U S. Okay. Um, and my favorite moment was probably, so we went and basically booked a bunch of shoots at a bunch of different locations we've always wanted to go to. And my favorite moment I think was at Horseshoe Bend, obviously because it's beautiful, but it was in that moment I was shooting. It was like what it was, I think the first shoot where it was like, this is like my first destination shoot basically where it's like, wow, this is amazing. And I just had this surreal moment where I was like, everything that I've been doing on social media and how I've been building up my business I'm here shooting at a location I've always wanted to shoot and I never would have imagined that I would be doing this. So it was very surreal to actually be able to experience something that I've been dreaming about for so long and traveling and shooting and then to see it actually happen. And then Charlie recorded all of it and like got footage of all of it, which that was cool too. Cause then I was able to share it with people and like look back at it and be like, wow, that actually happened. So that was probably like my favorite just moment of like, wow, this is crazy. I can't believe I'm doing this. Um, Obviously, every single place we went was amazing, but that specific location just really blew my mind because of that. What is Horseshoe Bend? It's like, um, it's, I think it's a part of the Grand Canyon. Okay. It's like, um, it's really popular to shoot at because there's like a big rock formation and it's like a little island and then it's surrounded by like a river at the bottom. And then you can go to the top of the canyon and see it from like the whole, like basically I would say half of the rock you can see. And so it's like a really cool, it's really cool. Like the water is kind of like blue and then all the rocks are orange and the sun sets right behind it. So it's like, yeah, 
it's really cool. And the nice thing about it is the walk there is like literally five minutes. So like you park and then you just walk five minutes. It's not like you have to go on like a long hike or anything. Oh, that sounds amazing. This is kind of a fun question, but do you have one like marriage advice? Cause you're such like a entrepreneur go-getter. <laughs> yeah. For marriage. <laughs> um, I think something that I've learned is just like, it's easy to just get into a routine and just be like, okay, I'm working until five. And then we have this one thing that, you know, like we have something scheduled until eight and then we're going to sit and watch Netflix until 1030 (laughs) and then we're going to go to bed. So Uh I think like the biggest thing that I've learned is just, I don't know, not letting routine (laughs) like just be boring, like making, making it fun, honestly. And also I think like the idea of being intentional with small things Um, so if I know that Charlie really likes words, he is like a words person. I'll try to go out of my way and be like, oh, I really like your shirt today. Or like, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Mm -hmm. like I'll just say something to him and it's Uh just like small things. I think thinking that we need this big grand gesture, like that's not realistic, especially when you live with each other, you're with each other every single day. Big gestures are like for Valentine's day or Mm -hmm. birthdays, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't be doing those all the time. So I think just like the small things and being intentional with like just that, is huge. Also, this is very random, but just remember to hug each other. Yeah. I love a good hug. <laughs> and like before you leave for a shoot, just 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 give your significant other a good hug, you know? Yes. I love that like touch. It's just I need that like every day. Like a little right. kiss or a little like a little pat on the back. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so your lasting advice to wedding pros and creatives and then your freebie and where to find you. Okay. So you want a piece of advice for weddings and creatives. That's what you said? Yeah, anything. Just like okay. kind of encourage them if they feel like they're in a drought or they're not booking or they want to give up or it's just any yeah. words of wisdom. Um, I think for anyone that feels like, yes, like they're not booking, like they want to give up, my biggest piece of advice is if something's not working in your business, then something needs to change. You can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results, right? Like that's like literally a thing. Like you just can't keep doing that. So if you feel like, oh, I'm not, I'm not booking enough high tier weddings. You need to change something in your business to help you book high tier weddings. Mm -hmm. Um, if you, if you feel like, oh, I'm not booking enough travel. I want to book more travel. You need to do something to help you book more travel these dream inquiries and dream clients are not just going to come to you. Like, yes, they might. Like there are some people that just get the perfect people that come to them and great. Good for you. But for me, I had to basically make those opportunities by making my portfolio and doing it myself. And then because of that, I was able to book the things that I wanted to. So if you're not seeing your ideal client come in the door, if you're not seeing enough bookings, then make a change to something and see if it works. If that doesn't work, make a change to something else. You know, like you can't, you have to be willing to change in order to see different results. Um, So yeah, that's what I'm going to say. I love it. (laughs) I I finally watched the Mel Robbins uh, video, No One's Coming. Everyone kept referencing it, but I finally like landed upon it. Like nobody is coming. Nobody is coming. (laughs) Yeah. Get off your ass. (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Um, And then, your freebie and where everyone could follow you because you are so fantastic to follow. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So I have a few freebies on my website there. Basically all my stuff is just Cassidy Lynn education.com and Lynn is with an E at the end. So Cassidy Lynn education, I have um, a free guide to camera gear, a free posing guide, and I have like a free resources guide. Um, And then for following me, you can literally find me on Instagram at Cassidy Lynn, like I said, with an E at the end. My hope is if you just start typing Cassidy, that I pop up. That it is does. my goal. It does. Oh, it, it does. does? Okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so Cassidy Lynn, and then on TikTok, it is Cassidy Lynn Photo. Um, hopefully, if you just start typing Cassidy Lynn Photo, I pop up as well. It does. Yeah, it does. That's- I checked this morning. <laughs> awesome. Cool. I, you're on top of it. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Follow me. Um, yeah, I also have a podcast. It's called Oh Shoot. And we do lots of interviews and just fun episodes. So yeah, you can go check that out as well. 
Yay. I love this conversation and I truly love your mind. And that this conversation was so refreshing. So thank you so thank much. You. Of course. Thanks for having me. It was an honor.